But with that, we want to go ahead and get the program started. First, I would like to introduce Mr. John Hodges, the assistant town manager with the town of Garner for the panel Moving Along Transportation Projects Take Center Stage. John and the panelists, if you guys would please come on to the stage. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> First, I want to, to thank everyone for being here on behalf of uh, the mayor and the council members that are here and our town staff leadership. We really want to thank you for coming today. This is a great partnership we have with the chamber, and we look forward to producing this every year um, and hope that this is, um, now that we're back to doing this somewhat uh, normally, we added our bus tour back, which is great to have you all out there with us today touring around. So uh, glad to have you here today. Thanks for being a part of this. Um, so as Matthew said, this, se this session is about transportation and moving along, and as the, the rapid growth of Garner and the Triangle continues, transportation infrastructure and regional connectivity will be critical to our future and the future of the Triangle. So to today we're going to hear from three experts who are responsible for planning and implementing projects that will keep us moving. We'll hear updates from them and discuss these, the projects mean for Garner and what new opportunities they create as we continue to grow. So our panel today is Joe Malazzo, the Executive Director of the, Re the Regional Transportation Alliance, Catherine Eggleston, the Chief Development Officer for Go Triangle, and Dennis Jernigan, the Acti Ch Acting Chief Engineer for Highway Operations for the North Carolina Turnpike Authority. I'm going to ask each of our panelists today to tell you a little bit about their organizations and their roles, and then present an update from their organizations. And after that, if time allows, we'll um, field some questions from the audience um, about what they presented today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Joe. Good afternoon. Happy to be your first presenter. It only gets better from here, so get excited about that. So we are really delighted to be here. So this is me, and I'll see if I can I see my forward that along with that. So my name is Joe Malazzo. I'm an executive director of the organization called RTA, Regional Transportation Alliance. We are the voice of the regional business community on transportation issues, and we've been around for a little over 20 years. Um, we were founded by the Raleigh, Durham, Chapel, Carborough, and Cary Chambers over 20 years ago, but now we count as our member chambers, certainly Garner here, Matthew and, and colleagues, but actually every Chamber of Commerce in Wake County, and then Durham County, Orange County, and in fact, over 25 Chambers of Commerce in 13 counties in Central and Eastern North Carolina, along with over 100 businesses. And the reason we work together and the business community is focused is exactly the same reason that you're here. You care about the community, you care about the region, and we need to make sure that we're being purposeful about the investments we make, in this particular case, transportation, but broadly, the things that we're trying to get done. RTA provides a regional business perspective. At a basic level, that means really two or three things. One, I would say, is we're constantly in touch with our members, the business community broadly, what their needs are, what their focuses are as they try to attract and retain talent, Obviously, those, those change over time. We had this little thing called a pandemic over the last few years. What we thought was important to us in business a few years ago, just like each of us, has changed. And it continues to change. And so we need to kind of continue to evolve with that. Also, RTA provides a focus on particular issues. We do not get into every issue. We have great transportation partners and our public sector partners that deal with all the details of that. That's not our job. It's not our role. But what RTA does do is to provide that focus on some of the key issues, policies, infrastructure projects, and so on, including a couple of them you're going to hear about from my, from my colleagues here on the panel here just a little bit. Our website is letsgetmoving.org. And, of course, you might almost guess about that. Obviously, it's transportation. It's a cute little website. But it's also a, a reminder that transportation projects do take a long time. We all know that. And part of what we're trying to do as the business community is make them take, to put a phrase on it, less forever. They're still going to take forever, whether the business community is engaged or not, but we sure like them to take a little less forever than they otherwise would be, and so that's what we're trying to do. So I'm going to go to the next slide here, and I believe that should be a map, I believe. Am I right? There it is. So this is a map of the extended triangle market, and you can see Garner there in south central uh, Wake County next to Raleigh, of course, as many folks in Garner say in economic development, Garner's closer to Raleigh than Raleigh, right, in many ways. And that's kind of a neat phrase to use, and it's exactly right. Uh, one of the reasons that Garner continues to be successful and increasingly successful 
is location, right? Just no matter what, you end up in the right spot, you can do good things. The second reason why Garner continues to be successful is purposeful leadership, and that's your public sector and your private sector. That goes to your mayor, that goes to your council, your manager, your economic development team, and your other colleagues, and your chamber of commerce. They're all forward-thinking. They've worked together. We're happy to partner with each of them. We've done that for many, many years. We're happy to continue to do that. Uh, RTA is a business organization, and broadly, has essentially five strategic areas of focus that we are focused on for the region as a whole. Garner is obviously part of that, but of course it's much, much broader than that. I'll talk about those. And if I'm going to go back, well, actually one slide to see if that will work. Does that do that? If you see there right in the below our logo, the RTA, where it says Accelerated Metropolitan Mobility Strategy, if you wanted to see it, you can go directly there. Again, the site is letsgetmoving.org and just click on that. Or you could just type in priorities after that and that will come up. But those five areas are sustainable funding for the airport, RDU Airport. That's our top priority. Number two is enhancing a regional transit system. You're going to hear, hear from that directly <clears throat> at some level from both these speakers, but in particular from Catherine, who's coming right after me. The next one is promoting rapid relief freeway improvements. And this directly, you're going to hear from Dennis about one of those that are so important to us. Number four is supporting mobility innovations and pilots. We want to make sure that we're looking at, God bless you, the new areas, innovative areas, that we're thinking about those and pushing things forward. And the last one is modernizing revenues about freeways and streets. The business model is changing on how we pay for transportation. We want to make sure we're purposeful here, not just in the Triangle, but in North Carolina as well. So as I cover those five areas just very briefly, the first one is the airport. We, have, we do have a wonderful airport. It is a pride and joy for all of us, whether you're here in Wake County, even well beyond the Triangle. RDU's catchment area goes into northern South Carolina and southern Virginia and much of eastern North Carolina and central North Carolina. It is a fantastic asset for us. It is obviously essential to the business community broadly. One of the challenges it has is in a fast-growing market, the business model no longer works exactly the way we would want it to, meaning there's, there's the need for more, and maybe even eventually a new terminal, but certainly at least more gates, an expanded runway. Those cost a lot of money. We do pay passenger facility charges. When you park at the airport, those fees go back to building a better airport. But at some point, the numbers don't quite work for that. So one of the things we are doing as an organization, as a business leadership group, is trying to get additional funding to pay for a new runway at RDU. It will be longer than the one we have today. It will be just to the west. And that will provide not just a better experience when you take off and land, but it will also free up space to widen and expand the terminal with a number of gates, the primary terminal there. So that's the 5L23R, to be technical, uh, runway there. So we're excited about that. So that's a basic thing that we're working on for that. And there will be other initiatives we do after that, but priority one is that. Number two is transit. And transit, to me, if we're going to put one word about transit, it's about options. Not everybody wants to drive. Not everybody can drive. And having another way of getting around is essential for any area, especially in a metropolitan one like ours. And so is, people say, is that going to be bus or is it going to be rail? And the answer is yes. We already have a good bus system. We have the beginnings of a rail system using the Amtrak service. Both of those need to expand, and they will expand. You're going to hear more about the rail element from Catherine, so I'll talk about that. But what I will tell you is there is something called BRT, which stands for Bus Rapid Transit. You might call it Backbone Rapid Transit as well. Uh, there will be, an, there'll be a line that terminates right here in Garner to go to downtown Raleigh, BRT. And there will be an extension that will go further south to Clayton over time. And both those should open within 10 years, which is exciting. In fact, the first BRT line uh, in the Triangle will, uh, will go under construction in less than one year. And so that's very exciting. In terms of freeway improvements, you're going to hear about 540. I won't take any of that thunder other than to say, Dennis, we support your work on that. So continue to build and do well with that. And we want to see that completed. And we have some other improvements like Capitol Boulevard. And I don't know any human being I've ever met that thinks Capitol Boulevard north of Raleigh is a great experience for any purpose whatsoever. Um, whether you're thinking about uh, walking, uh, driving, getting in and out of businesses, the pure aesthetic joy of it, there's not a single aspect of that that's good. And, but fortunately, uh, our city of Raleigh to the north of us has a plan that would improve the appearance, that would improve the safety and for the, what they call the through lanes, would eliminate every stoplight between 440 and 540. So this could be a remarkable experience. And at the risk of stating the obvious, we support that plan. We think that's fantastic. So we're super happy to support that. Mobility innovations, um, if you go to our website, letsgetmoving.org slash breakfast, uh, you can look at some innovations that were described <clears throat> at our most recent event this summer. 
Let me simply share with you that there's some videos on there, and there is a consortium of folks that are looking to ship artificial human organs from one hospital to another more efficiently using electric vertical aircraft or super drones. This is remarkable to me. They spoke at our thing. I won't take any more of your time, but it's worth your time this evening uh, to take a look at them. And finally, modernizing revenues for highways and streets. Uh, we all have this probably in our wallet or purse or what have you, a phone. We pay for that. We pay for that every month, and it doesn't matter how, much, how many minutes you use. If you notice that, it's the same. And RTA's position on transportation funding for our highways is we should do something very similar. We pay one price, and then we can then that'll have availability for us. We're calling it an access fee. And the reason we're doing that is because the gas tax fee is ultimately not going to work because not everybody uses the same amount of gas anymore. And also, now the other way of going about it is paying by the miles you use, which will work, uh, as long as we can get over the privacy issues, which is a potential challenge and that as long as there's no more pandemics and people stop driving. So in the absence of that, we're pushing for an access user fee. These are, this concludes my remarks. I will turn it over to Ms. Catherine and right over there. So please, let's welcome her. Thank you, Joe, and thank you uh, to John and Matthew. Really uh, happy to be here today and to share some information with you about Go Triangle. Go Triangle is the Triangle Area's regional public transportation provider. Uh, we uh, operate the green buses that you may see out there on the road um, that carry uh, more of the longer distance travel. Uh, we coordinate with uh, local bus systems in Raleigh, Go Raleigh, the red buses, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, as well as uh, local systems in Durham, Cary, uh, and Chapel Hill as well. In addition to our current operations, we also plan uh, for the future, some of those projects that hopefully will take less forever, as Joe mentioned earlier. So I'll get into uh, some planning for those uh, here shortly. Uh, so in the, in the here and now, there are three uh, bus routes in Garner today. Go Raleigh operates these, um, and uh, they are supported and potentially going to be expanded by the Wake Transit Plan, which I'll talk about uh, in a bit. We have one route, Route 7 on South Saunders Street, which operates uh, 15 minutes uh, throughout the day uh, during the week. And then we also have two hourly routes, uh, Route 20 and the 40X. You may see those uh, out on the road. So we do have... Um, some, uh, some transit options today um, from, from fixed route or buses that run a, a route on a schedule. Uh, and then there's also Go Wake Access, which provides some demand response uh, service within Garner as well. Uh, the Wake Transit Plan is expanding service. The Wake Transit Plan is the plan for how to use those dollars from the transit sales tax that's now collected in Wake County uh, since that 2016 referendum. There are four big moves that are part of the wake transit plan which you see on the screen here connect regionally which again go triangle is in a primary spot on that connecting all wake county municipalities again garner has bus service now there's a few other communities in wake county that have recently gotten bus service for the first time uh, providing frequent reliable urban mobility or that bus rapid transit uh, that joe was talking about earlier uh, that's one of the big pieces of the plan. And then enhancing access to transit throughout Wake County. Um, you know, we have these routes, but we don't necessarily have uh, sidewalks to help people walk from their home or their place of business to access the bus. Uh, so that's a component uh, of the plan as well. Uh, in the upcoming year, this current year that just started, our fiscal years run from July to June on this fiscal year that just started, there's $120 million being invested uh, throughout the county um, from the Wake Transit revenues uh, across a, a variety uh, of programs, including those that I just mentioned, uh, as well as the Community Funding Area Program, which is the one that's um, been used to start those new services uh, in locations throughout the county. Uh, Apex just launched its first uh, bus route a few months ago, Go Apex Route 1, uh, and uh, Morrisville uh, recently as well um, began an on-demand service where they have a shuttle uh, that you can uh, call or schedule on an app that will come pick you up and take you to where you're going within uh, their on-demand zone. So that's an innovative type of service. We're seeing more of that. Go Triangle operates uh, or has operated similar service in RTP. Uh, Durham is experimenting with uh, expanded on demand as well. Um, and I think we'll see more of that uh, throughout uh, Wake County and the Triangle uh, overall. 
uh, Wake Forest's uh, circulator bus are also supported by that program. Um, and uh, Fuquay Verena has done a, uh, a study, um, and as has Garner. Uh, so Garner got some funding from the Community Funding Area Program uh, within the last couple years to study transit expansion uh, within the town. Uh, so that study has been adopted, so we may see some uh, increased uh, transit options, some changes to those bus routes that I mentioned earlier to provide more access within the town of Garner in the coming years. Uh, Joe mentioned this earlier, Go Raleigh is building uh, bus rapid transit. So Go Triangle works with, as I mentioned, the other uh, transit agencies around the triangle uh, to uh, support projects like this. Uh, Go Raleigh is working on 20 miles of bus rapid transit, and this is um, high frequency bus service that has infrastructure uh, to provide a premium experience, premium stations, as well as some infrastructure for dedicated lanes where the bus has its own lane and can operate faster, more reliably um, than a bus that's just running in a conventional lane mixed with traffic. Uh, so we've got three corridors um, that Raleigh is moving forward with, those three on the left. They're moving forward with those now, and they have plans uh, for an additional one, uh, the northern corridor. Uh, those are kind of in, um, in uh, chronological order here with Newburn Avenue uh, in Raleigh that's moving forward. They just got their funding uh, from the federal government for construction. They expect to start construction on that next year. Uh, the Southern Corridor, which connects to Garner, uh, is the next one up. They plan to submit for uh, federal funding for that one next year uh, to get it under construction next within the next few years. Um, and then the Western Corridor that would connect downtown Raleigh uh, with Cary is also moving forward through that federal funding pipeline. For the Southern Corridor, you see the map and the stats over there. It's a little over five miles uh, with almost four miles of dedicated lanes. Um, so again, that's going to be a premium service um, that would, would operate more reliably, more quickly, um, potentially than conventional bus that's operating out there on the streets today. As traffic grows uh, in the future, we all know traffic um, in this area is already terrible, but may uh, you know, just increase as, as this area of the county grows, uh, as Johnston County grows. This type of service can provide a reliable trip or a much more reliable trip having its own dedicated lane for the bus to operate. Uh, timeline for this, again, um, they are looking to get um, into that pipeline, uh, or they are in the pipeline, but looking to make the formal application um, for federal funding next, uh, um, next year. Uh, there we go. Oh, there we go. So as I said, they have multiple projects moving forward in various states um, and a future one in uh, North Raleigh. Uh, they are also uh, working uh, with CAMPO, the, uh, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, to look at potential extensions even beyond this 20-mile service. Joe mentioned that, I think, earlier as well, extending from Garner uh, out potentially to Clayton and Johnston County. Uh, so Go Triangle uh, is spending a lot of effort right now studying commuter rail for the region. This is the map of the study area that we're looking at now. A few years ago, we looked at a very wide area from Mebane uh, in Alamance County all the way to Selma in Johnston County. Uh, two years ago, we started a feasibility study on um, a core area of that between West Durham uh, and, and Clayton. Uh, looking at options to uh, be able to implement commuter rail service or more frequent passenger service in uh, the existing rail corridor that's out there today. Uh, our funding partners on this study are Durham County, Wake County, uh, and Johnston County. Uh, the transit plan revenues in Durham and Wake, and then Johnston put in a little bit of uh, funding for this phase of the study uh, just to look at potentially including Clayton in this. Uh, this would have stops in uh, Durham, RTP, Morrisville, Cary, Raleigh, Garner, and potentially Clayton. We'll take a closer look at a couple of the potential station areas in Garner uh, a couple slides from now. Uh, what we're seeing in our study is that demand for this type of transit is high throughout the region. We're not like a conventional uh, commuter rail region where we have some suburbs that are connecting to a single downtown. We have a lot of places people are trying to go. Uh, Garner has, as you all know, a lot of destinations for business, a lot of jobs here in Garner. It's not simply uh, a bedroom community for Raleigh like uh, a lot of suburbs 
uh, in other places. So we have destinations throughout the corridor, um, places where people live throughout the corridor. So we see a lot of ridership um, throughout, Not again, not just a single place that people are trying to go um, of downtown Raleigh or to RTP. Uh, the feasibility study has uh, developed updated cost estimates, updated timelines for implementation, updated assessment of obstacles that would need to be overcome to be able to move forward. Our updated cost estimates for the project are in the range of $2.8 to $3.2 billion, which is a lot of money. That's a higher estimate than has been previously included in the Durham and Wake Transit plans. Um, so some work needs to be done to identify uh, what those funding sources would be and get a financial plan in there in order to move the project forward. So you'll likely hear a lot about that in the coming months uh, as the funding partners in the region, the counties, the Metropolitan Planning Organizations, Go Triangles Board, um, assess these feasibility study results and, and figure out how to move forward, uh, whether that's um, you know, just on a different timeline or potentially looking at a phased approach to implementation to be able to get started on a piece while the remainder is continuing to be developed. So as I mentioned, we've got two stations that we're looking at in Garner. Uh, one would be downtown. Uh, this is uh, an important station uh, for, uh, for the town to be able to access um, locations within downtown, provide an economic development opportunity uh, for downtown. And then we're also looking at one in, in Auburn, or basically right at uh, the interchange of NC540, the future NCA 540, uh, which Dennis will talk about in a minute, and US 70 business. So very good um, automobile access to that location. We're envisioning that would be a, a big place for park and ride um, from all over South, Southeast Wake County, uh, potentially people from Johnston County driving to access the station uh, at that location. Um, and this may, if the project does not include Johnston County initially, this would, would be the uh, eastern terminus or the end of the line uh, in, this, uh, in this area. So as I mentioned, we have some next steps here, uh, obtaining stakeholder input on the feasibility study results on these higher costs, the implementation uh, obstacles and what those opportunities are to move the project forward. Go Triangle staff and our partners will be refining the financial plan options, options for pursuing federal grants, a lot of different types of federal grants to be able to move the project forward. Um, and then ultimately uh, supporting a regional decision for how uh, and whether to go forward. Uh, in the short term. So that's what we'll be looking at um, over the next couple months. And at this point, I'm going to hand it over uh, to Dennis uh, to talk to you about uh, 540. I talked to the sound guy earlier. He said I had permission to move. So first of all, I want to thank you to the town of Garner for being asked to come and speak to you today. And for putting this great panel together, I, I've either present with or have been in the audience for, for Joe and Catherine many times, and so they're great presenters, and I'm honored to be a part of this group. So I want to start off, first of all, just tell you a little bit about Turnpike Authority. Is it the right arrow? Or just center? Here we go. So I'll tell you just a little bit about Turnpike Authority. So years ago, the General Assembly looked at ways projects got funded, and traditional funding was not meeting the need. And so the Turnpike Authority was formed first as a separate entity. About 10 years ago, we became a business unit of NCDOT. Now, how does the Turnpike Authority come to a road near you? So what happens is local leaders look at the available funding and the infrastructure needs, and when those numbers start to diverge, and it looks like something that is important to them is going to I'd be remiss if I didn't use Joe's term since everybody else has used it, the least forever, when they're looking at ways to get a facility built in the least forever, they will sometimes ask the Turnpike Authority to take a look at it and find out if it's a good candidate for a toll facility. And just to give you an idea of how we can sometimes deliver things faster, the existing Triangle Expressway would just be opening up now if we had gone with traditional funding. And prior to the pandemic, our traffic volumes in our busiest location exceeded 60,000 vehicles a day. So think of all those people who would be stuck on US-1 and NC-55 and 64 and those other places. Uh, we don't just operate and maintain and build toll roads. We are constantly looking for ways to improve motorist experience. We have tried out over half a dozen different wrong-way driver technologies, both on Triangle Expressway and Monroe. We partnered with NCDOT to look at some pilots for 
extending the life of pavement markings. And back in 2017, we became involved in the connected and autonomous vehicle circuit. And if you want to hear that, I can talk to you all day about that. But one of the things we do, too, is work with other states to try and, and provide more of a global motorist experience. So what you're seeing here in blue, we are one of the most interoperable toll agencies in the nation. 19 states that if you have a hard case transponder, they will honor ours, we honor theirs, we have reciprocity agreements. So you can use one transponder and drive in these states. Now, if you're using the sticker, it just applies to Peach Pass and Sun Pass. So make sure before you go north and you come back and, and try to call me out for that, make sure you've got the correct transponder. Point this way. Okay. To give you an idea of our program, I'll, I'll lean more toward this side. Maybe it's uh, more this side. Okay. To give you an idea of where we are right now, our program currently is about $6 billion as far as projects either built or in the pipeline. So if you look at this map, the ones that are in green are facilities that are open. Most, I think everybody here is familiar with Triangle Expressway. Monroe Expressway is a bypass east of Charlotte around the town of Monroe. The blue boxes here are projects that are under construction. We're going to talk about Complete 540 in the top middle today. The white boxes that are outlined in gray are projects that are currently in the planning and programming phases. And the one that's in white but outlined in green is a public-private partnership. I-77 express lanes north of Charlotte is 26 miles of express lanes that is operated by a concessionaire. It's a public-private partnership. We collect the tolls. So that's our association. We collect the tolls, and we get a, a fee for collecting those tolls. Point this way. Again, we're here to talk about 540 today, give you a sort of a current state of the union where we are on 540. What you see here is the complete circle, but you notice three different colors. What is in gray is currently open. The, the northern piece from I-87 over to I-40 and the north side there, that is the free piece. And then from just below 40 west of Raleigh down to NC-55 in the Apex Holly Springs area, that's Triangle Expressway. The bottom part is blue, and you see that in the middle there. That's what we call phase one that's under construction. And then green is the second piece, phase two, that will complete the loop. Phase one is actually made up of three different projects. When we put these projects together, if we had put one contract out there, it's all told pre-construction right away utilities is $1.3 billion. It's a $1.3 billion effort. Construction contract wise, it's about $760 million. So if we put that out there as one contract, a lot of the local contractors are not going to be able to go after that work. It's just too big. Even the subcontractors, they can't do it. So we broke that into three smaller parts and our intent was to have a small, medium, and large, small being the A project on the left, the medium, the B project in the middle, and the big project, the R2828. The STIP designations are on the bottom of the screen. So for brevity, I'll call it A, B, and 2828. You see in gray here the missing piece, phase two, which we just mentioned, I just mentioned as well. On phase one, we're having, we're, there'll be seven interchanges. We're finishing the 55 interchange and then building six more. And you see those listed on the bottom right here. Some of those are obvious, US 401, NC 50, I 40. And then we worked with local leaders to figure out where they wanted those service interchanges, what were gonna be their gateways and corridors. And that's how we ended up with Bells Lake and uh, Holly Springs Road and Old Stage Road. Now we put those three contracts out and this was the result. Our small project actually became our medium project. But these are the, uh, you see the contract amounts here on the bottom. And what you'll notice here just under the letters A, B, and C is all three projects went to joint ventures. So we had Flatiron Branch on A and B and Lane Blythe on the 2828 project. But all three did have different designers. So we had Gannett Fleming on A, HDR, and uh, WSP on the 2828 job. Typical section, what is the road going to look like? It's going to look like Triangle Expressway in one regard, and that is three lane facility, three lanes in each direction, six lane facility, 12 foot shoulder. So we have full width shoulders inside and out. We've got a 70 foot median in case we need to widen in the future, we can do the widening to the median with minimal right away impacts to the outside. Now what you see here is an excerpt from a presentation for 2828 where we have concrete pavement, but on the A and the B job, we have asphalt pavement. So all the pavement industries get a little love too. In addition to the, the regular construction contractors, so we are setting up for the future with that 70-foot medium. A couple of stats on the project. We have 52 bridges and 33 culverts, a lot of structure work. We have two power transmission lines. If you've ever dealt with anything in construction, it is not easy to relocate a high-voltage power transmission line. 
We had nine different petroleum line crossings with two different companies. We actually had 10, but we designed one out before we ever went to construction. Our longest conflict was over 8,000 feet long. And every time they shut one of these lines down to make, a, to make a connection so we can reroute it and put it in a new place, it cost a little over a quarter million dollars every time they shut it down. And so when we got to the last three conflicts, they were all on the 2828 job. And we worked with, the, with Colonial Pipeline. We did it all in one day. They had a crew of about 150 people. We had 30 people on standby, 24-hour operation. And by doing that, we saved the taxpayers over $600,000. Local municipal infrastructure. One of the things that's very important is looking ahead. What you're seeing here, the, the black pipe on the ground, is a town of Apex sewer casing. So they know they've got infrastructure. We also work with town of Garner, and I'll mention that as in a, an upcoming slide. But we work with local municipalities on future infrastructure as well as bike pet accommodations. This slide, originally, when we first started talking about 540, you think, oh, neighborhood proximity, you're going to have this pretty much anywhere you build a road. But the pandemic changed that dynamic completely. Because now, everybody in one of those houses is work, that's their office. And so now it went from, don't bother me at night, don't work at night, to don't work anytime. Because if you bother me during the day, I'm working. And if you bother me at night, I'm sleeping. And we can't just drop a road in place. And so this became a big deal. But one of the things that we did was to try to build some of our noise walls early so we could help offset that. So even when people went back, the ones that were still working from home, we could try and minimize some of that impact. You'll see on the left and right side of the road, and this is Saul's Road, and this is that same neighborhood. If you notice top left, that row of Leland Cypress is the same row you saw in the previous photo. But uh, all of our noise walls are real brick, no painted panels. So for long-term maintenance, that was our intent. We make a, more, a, a bigger investment up front, and we save money on maintenance in the long run. Bike pad accommodations. When you're building a controlled access facility, 70 miles per hour um, speed limit, 75 mile an hour design speed, don't necessarily have a lot of opportunities for bike ped because you don't want bicyclists and pedestrians out there riding on your shoulder. But we were able to work with our local municipalities, local leaders, and we're accommodating in 20 different locations bike ped accommodations. I'll highlight a few of those here, but they include pedestrian culverts, extending bridges for greenways, multi-use paths, sidewalks, bike lanes, shared bike lanes. And you see an example of this here at Old Stage Road. It won't work on the TV. So we've got a 10-foot multi-use path on the right side, sidewalk on the left side, your standard 12-foot lanes. Then when you go to NC50, we have shared outside lanes. You see how we've got a narrower left lane or median lane, 11 feet. Our outside lane is 14 feet, and we've got sidewalk on both sides. So at all of the interchanges that are in the Garner area, I'll call it, uh, in the Garner region, we have some sort of bike pad accommodation. Just to, <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just to give you an idea of, of what the interchange configuration is going to look like, at NC50, this was the original design. It had uh, basically, it was almost a full diamond with one loop in the northwest quadrant. Our designer did change that. This is a, a, a simulated, it's, it's out of his simulation and he went to a half clover. So half clover, half diamond is what you see at NC50. This is the area between 50 and 40, and I showed this because this is where Swift Creek, Swift Creek cuts across our alignment. Everybody in this area probably knows how sensitive Swift Creek is, Dwarf Wedge Muscle, very important, very sensitive. Our project includes, out of all the bridges we've got, the 52 bridges, we have 6,600 feet that are spanning streams and culverts. So a mile and a quarter, about 30% of our bridges are spanning wetlands, streams, and tributaries, and not just other roadways. This is one of the more unique interchanges that you will see in North Carolina. A turbine interchange is when two major intersect, or two major facilities intersect. There's a turbine interchange north of Charlotte at 485 and I-85. It, it looks complicated, it looks like a big, big roundabout, but it's actually very simple. We have three facilities. We have 540, 40, and US 70. So we had to have something that in the design year is going to accommodate about 200,000 vehicles. This is a very efficient interchange. Most of these movements, with the exception of the loops, can be made at 55 miles an hour. We have separated the free movements and the toll movements to try and eliminate confusion. This interchange takes up 481 acres. We have 37 acres of pavement, 13 bridges, six of which cross I-40. 
the distance between the southern bridge and the northern bridge is five-eighths of a mile. It's a very significant interchange. When we complete the interchange with phase two, that 481 acres goes to 630 acres. Now, if anybody's familiar with this area, I don't know if you notice anything about where 540 crosses 40, but there's something that's missing. This is a fairly recent photograph. See a difference between that and that? The US 70 bridges are gone. Our design build team evaluated it and found that this was originally gonna be a three level interchange by our preliminary design. He collapsed it into two levels, eliminated the 70 bridges, eliminated about a million yards of dirt and it saved $15 million. Now we'll say one thing about this interchange. It may look like a roundabout, you can't go in a circle. So you, you can't get on there and get stuck. If you get on it, you gotta get off somewhere else. But this is taken about three months ago, just again, I give you an idea, it's really taking shape. You can see the circular nature of the interchange there. I mentioned earlier, we worked with Garner on some future infrastructure planning. The next three slides are gonna show you some from a, a what we call a wet utility standpoint. At uh, Old Stage Road, we're installing water line encasements for future water lines. So under the ramps in the main line, we have encasements that are being installed. At Holland Church Road, we have a water line casement. And then at NC50, we have both water and sewer. So they are, the, the leaders in Garner are looking to your future to make sure it, they're, they're spending a dollar today to save a dollar tomorrow, to save two dollars tomorrow. So just know that uh, they work very well with us on that. On the 2828 job, even though we're building for the future, we also have to look to our past, we have to protect our past. So our NCDOT has an archeology span unit and they found there was a significant site on the 2828 job. And what you see in these photos are some of the excavations we hired a, uh, an archeologist to come out, archeology span firm. They came out, did excavations. Make sure I'm, I'm running tight, I know. They found uh, artifacts from two different periods, 6,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. Very significant site there. They gathered over 16,000 artifacts. They're being processed. I'd love to have some updated pictures, but the artifacts are still being processed. What you see here is a beekeeper in a house. Common, right? Okay. So when I see that, based on the era I grew up, I start thinking Amityville Horror and it's time to get out of the house. But this particular homeowner had a beehive in the wall. They lived with that. That house had to be relocated, had to be demoed. And so once we bought the house and we found out it was there, instead of just sending that hive to the landfill because pollinator populations are in decline, we sent a beekeeper out there. He went out there and recovered the hive so he could maintain that, keep those bees alive. Pollinator populations on decline, folks. They, if, they don't, if they don't pollinate the food, we don't eat. So we called them out there. They were very happy to get that. And I like this picture just because you never know what you're gonna see in construction. Just because we buy the house doesn't mean it always gets torn down. The homeowner retained the house. We came out on a Saturday. He didn't tell us he was gonna move it. And there's a house in the middle of the road. We also coordinated with the North Carolina Native Plant Society. And right briefly, what these folks do, they're a group of volunteers. If you've got clearing that needs to be done, they'll come out on a Saturday and look for threatened and endangered plants before you clear and they relocate those, so it's a way to save those plants. A couple of quick things about the project, just to give you a, mag a scope of uh, magnitude. Our bridges and culverts, if you put them end to end, are 4.3 miles long. That would stretch from the highway building where I work over to Dorton Arena. Do I need to cut it off? Okay. If you put our girders end to end, 15.6 miles. They would stretch all the way from downtown Raleigh to Clayton. Bridge piles that support, you see the pile drivers make a lot of noise, nobody likes it. You put those end to end, you can circle the belt line in the lower section of 40, to almost 25 miles. Silt fence would stretch all the way from Raleigh to Benson and back. I chose Benson because that's where I live. And then uh, structural concrete, not including bridge decks. If you took all of it, put it in one big block, covers a football field, 10 and a half feet thick slab of concrete. And reinforcing steel, we couldn't build all the Eiffel Tower, but we could build 60% of it. So a lot of product out there. And finally, this is my last piece here, community outreach. We love talking about the project. You can probably tell that because I can feel I need to cut this off. But we love to take information out and talk to people directly. Everybody knows what happens when a friend tells a friend who tells a friend who tells a friend. And the last friend doesn't get what the first friend got. And we don't like that. We want you to get the latest and greatest information, whether it's coming out and talking to one person in their kitchen, uh, a uh, civic organization, or an HOA. We want to come out. If you want to hear it, call us. Taylor sitting right here, she's our comms lead. She will set up something, we'll come out and talk to you. This gives you an idea of how much we have talked about it. Just in 2022, 60 meetings, 
over 2,400 participants. If we have something that's going to be disruptive to neighborhoods, we send out postcards. We do next door posts to let people know. We don't want you to be surprised. We don't want you to wake up and hear pile driving and not know what's coming. We want you to know it in advance. We have a dedicated hotline and email address that we have staffed by a consultant. And you see the number of emails and calls we've taken. Last year in 2021, we averaged almost five contacts a day through those two means. A couple of our resources briefly on our website. Everybody wants to know about noise walls. So as soon as we knew where our noise walls were going to be, that on the left, we put a, a, a noise wall chart up there to show where they're going to be, how long it was going to be, and the height, how tall it was going to be. The middle interactive map there is on our website, on our project website. It has construction drums. You click on one of those drums, you get a pop-up box on the left. It tells you what the activity is, when it's going to start, how long it's going to last. We get a 75 hits a day on that. It's really popular. And then the bottom right is an interactive map. If there are any realtors out there, you want to know what the proximity to the project is, you can call that up. You can measure. It shows you the different types of right-of-way, controlled access versus regular right-of-way. And the reason you see those colors is it's color-coded based on municipal limits. And I said we had a project email address and website. They're listed here. We also have Twitter handles. Follow us. And with that, I'll turn it back over to John. Thank you so much. Thank you to Dennis and Catherine and Joe all for those great presentations. Uh, before we uh, have a, a couple of questions, I did just want to follow up a little bit on a couple of things that were mentioned. Um, it's pretty obvious that these folks are involved in, in planning projects that take forever and, and are a long time out, as was mentioned earlier. But I just want to put in a plug for the planning that we do at a local level, because many of the things that they mentioned today happen as a result of plans that were done by folks who worked here even before I did. Um, the, the station for the, the commuter rail that may be in downtown was put on a plan more than 20 years ago, four or five transit plans ago, and we've kept the, the spirit alive and, and, and really lobbied to move that forward. Catherine mentioned a circulator plan that we did while funding was available from the transit plan. We have that plan now, and our goal is to have that circulator route in place by the time the BRT system is coming to Garner. Um, there's actually some taxpayer-approved funds in the 2021 bonds for some of the infrastructure that we would need to start that, like bus stops and so forth. Um, the, Dennis mentioned the, the bike ped facilities uh, on 540. Those are only there because we do long-range planning for both transportation projects and parks, recreation, and greenways projects. So our plans feed into the work that regional uh, plans are using and they feed into the work that all these folks are doing on a regular basis. So I'm, I'm telling you all that because I want to put in a plug and ask you to pay attention whenever we've got a survey out on the website where we're asking for input, we've got a community meeting, or we've got a pop-up at the night market in downtown. Um, hopefully, this gives you an understanding of the importance of you stopping for a moment and filling out that card or clicking on that link and filling out that survey for us because those responses literally do speed up and let us do things like put bike ped facilities on something like 540. Similarly, our staff works on utility extensions and, and plans ahead to know where those are going to be needed. So I just wanted to follow up on their comments and put in a quick plug for the importance of community input and community feedback. So please be on the lookout when we're asking for those. We've got a couple of minutes today for, for some questions and uh, q and A. I want to just see first if there's anything from the audience that there, anyone had a question about that our group might could field. And if you do, Mari's got a microphone that she'll bring out to you. So Joe, you know, you talked a little bit about drones and all that. What's really the regulation that goes on with it? Because, I mean, something could fall from the sky, hit someone, hit something, you know, and cause power outages, accidents. How does that work? That's a great question. And just to repeat that, so everybody heard, the question was about drones, because that's obviously a new technology. What are the regulations by the Federal Aviation Administration, NCDOT, and others? As a gentleman working for the Business Committee, I don't want fully know all of those. All I know is that they do exist. They're, they're constantly evolving for the exact reason that you mentioned to make sure that those are safe. I think they are working on different travel paths for those. If I remember right, there was even some initial work, and it may still be going on with Wake Med over right here in Wake County to do some of the initial back and forth shipping 
between uh, sam like drug samples or drugs as well. So Dennis, you work for the department. I can put you on the spot unless you know more than I do about what DOT regs might be for that. Do you have any idea at all for that? I don't. Yeah, I don't. So. I mean, that's, we have the, the aviation group, but uh, that's one of the things that they do. They have a drone division over there, but yeah, I don't. That, yeah, it's a great question. I'm sure we could, we could probably get more information, send it back to him and follow up. Yeah. Anyone else have a question in the audience? Thank you, folks. This was a, a treasure trove of information on transportation. I'm curious about the viability of boring technologies, the tunneling that we're hearing about that's going on out west. Uh, I recently was solicited to invest in a company that claims to be able to do it a lot better, faster, cheaper than Elon Musk's company. Uh, interested in hearing your thoughts on underground tunnels. I'll mention one thing. So we, RTA is a business group uh, one of the things we do is, and I appreciate the question, is we're always looking for new innovations and new ways to learn, new things that are out there. So we took a tour of uh, South Florida back in March, and we didn't see the tunnel per se, but we did learn that the city of Fort Lauderdale is looking at drone tech, or not drone, boring technology, just like you mentioned, for both vehicles and also for their transit system. And that's an area where obviously tunneling would be at least instinctively somewhat of a challenge because you're right next to the ocean and they're le actually looking at it there. I don't know more about it other than I know Las Vegas has a, uh, I think it's a Tesla tunnel from different areas of their convention center that's active now. And I know Fort Lauderdale is actively looking at it for both highways and transit, but it's not built or approved yet. Dennis, do you have other thoughts or Catherine from your respective areas? Sure, just uh, very briefly, um, certainly tunneling is part of a lot of projects, especially transit projects in large cities. Um, New York, uh, Toronto are all extending underground transit systems that they have now. Um, so have, you know, boring machines that are tried and true for that type of more conventional underground construction. With that, you always have a lot of complexity. Dennis mentioned earlier, you know, the complexity of overhead uh, electric transmission. But when you're talking about underground with existing utilities in a highly populated area, that's going to be very complex, um, but definitely doable, uh, as we've seen, you know, around the country, around the world. Some of the newer uh, boring technology, I think, from my perspective, I'm interested in seeing where that goes um, to, to see uh, whether there are uh, projects like what Joe mentioned uh, or, or larger ones in larger areas that um, that are able to better fund innovative technologies. So I don't have anything to add beyond what Joe and Catherine have as far as from a, a larger bore from a vehicle standpoint, but I can share with you that we do, the department already uses boring that is large enough that some tr um, bike pet accommodations could fit inside those. When we get to, uh, in my career, we've had pipes that are large enough they were, they were larger than the standard pipe size, but we wanted to keep things underground and they could have accommodated. So some of that technology has been used, just not for the purpose of mobility. We got a couple of questions. Um, hey. Going back to drones, uh, my house is on Turner Farms right there by the 540 a mile, literally. Um, we saw a drone buzzing around our property. Uh, I don't know if it was you guys or if it was somebody else. Okay, if it was looking into your house, it was definitely not us. Yeah. <laughs> I will share with you that uh, about every three weeks, one of our engineers goes out and photographs the entire project, and that's for project documentation for several reasons. The contractors do that. The, the Turnpike Authority does that. That's very common these days is to use drones to document progress along the corridor. We don't... We don't get outside the right of way to look inside people's homes. We may get outside the right of way just to get us a, a panoramic scope. But if it's ours, I assure you nobody's looking inside your home. I think we've got time for one more question today. Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Catherine, we appreciate you and, 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 and all of the panel being here. All of us in this room today are reluctant to give up our cars and get on any public motor transportation. So, and I'm sure it, it, 
it's a full-time job to find ways to induce us to use bus rapid transit. Tell us, give us some insight, if you would, on what you're doing to get us out of our cars and off the street and get in your buses. Sure, absolutely. I think that's a that's a great question uh, of how can we in a region like this one where there is so much um, that all of us really depend on uh, our cars to get where we're going um, with um, with a, a transit system that can definitely be improved in the future. I would say what the transit plan is doing right now uh, is improving service, making service more frequent, more reliable, so that it becomes a better option. That's that's good, really, for two reasons: because people who do rely on transit today uh, to get everywhere they need to go to uh, jobs, to medical appointments, even to shop for groceries, improving service uh, for today's customers makes it better for everyone as well. Um, that can uh, reduce the length of the trip, make it more convenient, make connections more convenient. Uh, so we're doing that now uh, for conventional bus service, increasing uh, the frequency, having it operate later into the evening, more on weekends, more when people are wanting to travel. Uh, also right now, uh, region-wide, uh, transit in the Triangle uh, is zero fare. Uh, to, to try the bus right now, you do not need to pay a fare. Uh, we have had that in place since the beginning of the pandemic uh, for safety reasons, allowed people to enter um, the bus without interacting with the driver, but we have kept that in place. All the agencies around the Triangle have uh, committed to keep that in place through this fiscal year, so through next summer. Uh, so if you are interested in trying transit, you can do that for free right now. Um, and then thinking longer term, as traffic in the region continues to, to increase, continues to be more and more uh, inconvenient to drive. Um, NCDOT, Turnpike Authority, are working on that from the roadway side. Uh, and then we and our transit partners are working on that from the transit side, providing uh, options that will be reliable, uh, investing in dedicated infrastructure in bus lanes that will make traveling on the bus competitive uh, with traveling in a car, in some cases potentially actually faster. And certainly with commuter rail, um, that would provide a very competitive uh, or potentially a faster trip uh, between some of our larger cities uh, as the as the traffic in the region gets worse. Uh, Joe thinks about this a lot too. You know, I wonder if Joe has anything to add. Yeah, I would first echo everything that Catherine said. Her perspective on that is exactly spot on. Buckets, uh, your your question's great. This is really about creating options, and when we think about looking at these travel options. You have to ask yourself both, what, what would work for me now, but what would work for others who might have a different life than I do in terms of where they work, where they live, where they're getting around for their civic activities, health care, taking care of parents, all the things they do in their life. And then what, is it, what, can, what are we going to need for all of us five years from now, 20 years from now? What is going to make sense? So it might be that certain investments are not going to be workable for some of us right now in terms of commuting, and we won't use those for our, for our commuting. That doesn't mean they're not worthwhile. It just means we need to broaden our aperture a little bit with the other ways we can do it. And what she mentioned about the dedicated lanes for bus and then the rail, just to give you one example for all of us right now. I mean, people say, would the triangle be ever be suitable for train service? And I remind them it already is right now. We already have it right now. You can go from Raleigh to Cary, five times a day, both directions, 79 miles an hour nonstop in 10 minutes on the Amtrak service. And so that's today. You can do that. Another four trains, or the four of those continue on to Durham. What Catherine's talking about is not about whether we're going to be doing commuter rail, regional commuter rail. The answer is we will. All we're talking about now is what's the best way to expand that service in terms of frequency, in terms of stops, in terms of system extent. That's the conversation that's going on. So, and it's similar for bus. So I want to thank our panel again for being here today. I know that they may not be able to stay with us the rest of the day, but if you have additional questions, I'll be here all day. So see me, and I'll be glad to relay the questions back and get answers, and we'll share them with the group today. So please help me with a round of applause to thank our panel for being here today.